Colligative properties are a series of properties of liquids that depend on the number rather than the type of dissolved particles within a solution. There are four main ones that you have to know for the MCAT. Boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, osmotic pressure, and Raoul's law. And the first thing to note is that for these first two, the boiling point elevation and the freezing point depression, what they serve to do is keep the solution in the liquid phase for longer. And so they make it harder to boil the particular solution and so it will increase the likelihood that it remains in the liquid phase. They also make it harder to freeze and so they kind of push the freezing point a bit to the left as well. In order to understand colligative properties, you have to introduce yourself to a quantity known as the Van't Hoff factor or I. What that is, is something that corrects for the number of solute particles that you put in versus the number of dissolved particles that that produces. So for example, if you have calcium chloride, which is CaCl2, it's a salt with one calcium and two chloride ions, you are only putting in one calcium chloride, but you'll yield three different dissolved particles. You'll have a dissolved calcium two plus ion and two dissolved Cl minus ions. And so the Van't Hoff factor for calcium chloride is going to be three. You put in one CaCl2 and you end up getting three particles. With NaCl, you put in one of those and you end up getting two different dissolved particles. And since colligative properties care about the number rather than any other qualities of the dissolved particles, it's very important to realize how the Van't Hoff factor interacts with these. So the first two that we'll go through are boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. And these have very, very similar formulas. You take the Van't Hoff factor, multiply it by some constant, which uh, here is Kb for the boiling point elevation. It's Kf for the freezing point depression. And then you multiply that by the molality of the solute. So they're both very similar. The boiling point elevation one involves Van't Hoff factor times some boiling point elevation constant times the molality of the solute. And notice that this constant is something that applies to the solvent. So if you're dissolving it in water, the water will have its own Kb that you consider. It's not something that depends on the type of particle that you have dissolved in the water. It's a quality of the water itself. And if it's some other liquid, then it will have its own Kb, its own boiling point elevation constant. The way that the boiling point elevation works is based on the recognition that boiling occurs when the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. Remember that the temperature of boiling is where the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. And this is something that we covered in our video on phases. What happens when you have dissolved particles in water is that if it's a non-volatile particle, and we'll go through that in a second, what ends up happening is that you have more of these solute particles at the surface. Remember that what creates the vapor pressure is that thin layer of particles above the surface of the liquid gas interaction. There will be a thin layer of gas particles that are created when the liquid enters this gas phase. But the interesting thing is that as you add more interfering solute particles, there's less surface area for these water particles to enter the gas phase. So at a given temperature, there will be fewer particles that exist in the gas phase because some of the surface area is being taken up by these solutes. And so what that means is that at any given temperature, you will have fewer particles in the gas phase which means that your vapor pressure, the vapor pressure again is a product of the number of gas particles right above that liquid, the vapor pressure will be lower at any given temperature. And so in order to get a vapor pressure that competes with atmospheric pressure, you're going to have to raise the temperature more in order to do that because there's less surface area for this exchange to happen. Previously, you might have had a few more water particles and one or two of them might have entered the gas phase here. So boiling point elevation is expressed formulaically like this. The change in the boiling point equals the Van't Hoff factor 
times the boiling point elevation constant times the molality of solute. And the reason that it occurs is because there is some interference of this surface that makes it so that fewer of these particles are going to be able to enter the gas phase. Thus, it's going to be harder to get to a given vapor pressure that will allow this thing to boil. And so that's how boiling point elevation works. It's basically these particles at the surface prevent these other particles from entering the gas phase. Freezing point depression is something where you have to lower the temperature even further in order to freeze your particular material. And the reason that that happens is because remember, when you are taking a liquid and then freezing it, what you have to have is a lattice that develops, a lattice-like solid structure that develops. And that means that the solvent particles are interacting with each other in such a way that it forms a fairly rigid structure, either a crystalline or amorphous solid structure. And what happens when you add more particles is that they get in the way, they interfere with the solvent particles forming that particular lattice. And so it becomes harder to do that and you have to lower the temperature further. You have to take more heat energy out of that environment in order for that lattice to form. So the formula for expressing freezing point depression is very similar to the boiling point elevation one. It involves the change in the freezing point, the change in the downward direction, equal to the Van't Hoff factor times some freezing point depression constant that will be given to you, times the molality of the solute. And the reason that this occurs is because those solute particles get in the way of the formation of that lattice that is necessary for a liquid to turn into a solid. You see these both in real life when, for example, if you're trying to boil noodles or pasta or something like that, you may put some salt in there in order to increase the boiling point of that water. It raises the boiling point of that water because the salt particles get in the way of this surface interaction between the liquid phase and the gas phase. And thus, the vapor pressure above that liquid is lower at any given temperature. So that means you have to raise the temperature more and more in order to boil that water. You see a freezing point depression, for example, if you live in a snowy area and they put salt onto the sidewalk in order to melt the snow. What the salt does is the salt gets in the way of that lattice and makes it so that in order to form ice, you have to be at a lower temperature. And a lot of times what that salt does is that salt makes it so that at whatever temperature it is outside, the snow no longer exists as a solid ice crystal form, but instead operates in the liquid form. And so these are two very important colligative properties that share a lot in common when you're looking at their formulas. And remember the Van't Hoff factor matters because the Van't Hoff factor tells you if you put one NaCl particle in, one NaCl solute particle, it actually produces two different dissolved particles. It produces an Na plus and a Cl minus. And so that Van't Hoff factor corrects for those. And they both operate according to very similar principles with some constant that will be given to you. But it's important to realize that boiling point elevation occurs because there's interference at this liquid gas surface. And thus it's harder for enough of these liquid particles to enter the vapor phase so that you get to the point where the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. The reason that freezing point depression occurs is because the dissolved particles get in the way of the necessary interactions that must form for the liquid to turn into a solid. And that essentially is all about the lattice formation that is necessary for that solid. Osmotic pressure is another colligative property and it's created by the desire of water to equalize the concentrations of solute on both sides of a semi-permeable membrane. So here's a semi-permeable membrane and notice that these particles in here cannot cross over to the other side. So in order to get the concentrations closer, the water will want to move to the right side. Usually when you see osmotic pressure, it's being equalized or neutralized by hydrostatic pressure. 
Now this is something that could show up on the MCAT physical sciences section because you have both physics and chemistry. But remember that pressure equals density times the gravitational force times y, which is the height of a water column over a point. And so the hydrostatic pressure says that here, because the height of the column of water is much greater, there's far greater pressure here than there is on this side. But what's neutralizing that is that there's an osmotic pressure created by the desire of the water to move this way due to concentration dynamics. So it wants to move to the left because of hydrostatic pressure differences. It wants to move to the right in order to neutralize the concentrations on either side, which will be impossible here because the concentration here is zero and the concentration will have to be something a little bit greater than zero because there are simply some particles here. The way that you express osmotic pressure is that osmotic pressure, which is a pi symbol, is how it's depicted, is equal to the Van de Hoff factor times the molarity. Notice these two are based on molality. This one is based on molarity times R, which is the gas constant, times the temperature in Kelvin. And the R value that you use here is the liters times atmosphere per Kelvin times mole one. And that's 0 0.08206. You can also simplify it as 0 0.0821. And a lot of times when you're working through this on an exam, R will be given to you. But the formula is something that you'll want to commit to memory, and that is that osmotic pressure equals the Van de Hoff factor times the molarity of the solution over here times the gas constant times the temperature. And what osmotic pressure serves to do is it serves to balance out hydrostatic pressure differences. And so it makes up for the desire of water to move left due to hydrostatic physical pressure by the fact that the water wants to move right due to osmotic forces. Because water cares more about neutralizing the number of particles on either side. The particles themselves might end up moving in a way that they neutralize their own concentrations on either side. But if it's not permeable to the particles, you cannot have movement of particles across that membrane. What you can have move is water. And water will try to move over here so that the concentration of particles on this side equals the concentrations on that side. That's what osmotic pressure is. And you see this a lot with starling forces and movement across capillaries in cardiac physiology and a lot of places. So understand how osmotic pressure works and understand that osmotic pressure relates to the desire of water moving in an osmotic manner to counteract hydrostatic pressures that may also be going on at a point in time. Thank you.